Okay. So we have lectures. Um, the lecture schedule. We're going to have it's uh, Fridays from nine to twelve, and this will be in this room P twelve, and the lectures also on Monday, which is a bit unfortunate schedule from 8 to 12. If you are not a morning person, I hope you make the effort to come in class, but um, to come to class, but you know, it might be difficult, P11. Yes? 8 to 11, right? Monday? Oh, today's three hours, Monday is, yeah, two, two hours, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so today we have the long session. Okay, I thought it was the opposite. Okay. Um, Mondays. We, the way it's uh, specified, I think, if we have, usually NTNU, we divide uh, lectures between lecture and, uh, and practice. So it's supposed to be Monday, supposed to be theory, and Friday is supposed to be a mixture, I think, between theory and practice. But the way I have run this course before is that we don't really, I don't want to have a fixed schedule for exercise. Okay, sometimes you have to cover some theory before giving the exercise, so you need some more time. So then you use the Friday to give full theory and maybe on Monday to have the exercise. Okay, so I hope that's not a problem for you. Okay, it hasn't been a problem before, but some people like to have a structure. I like to have always the exercise on one day and always the theory on one day. But for this course, it's, it's a bit difficult. It's, uh, sometimes it takes a bit longer time, sometimes it takes shorter time, so it's a bit difficult to, to, to plan. Okay? So I hope that's fine with you. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, the schedule is we're going to have lectures, you know, continuously, I think all the way until, I think April, we have uh, the, the Easter break, okay, and then we don't have any lecture on Monday, so we are resuming our lecturing, I think it's on the 17th, okay. We hope not to have, I hope to cover much of the material, such that we don't have to lecture too much after Easter. You only have to maybe deliver the last exercise set. Okay. But it might be the case that we are, you know, for some reason we don't manage to cover that much, so we might have to lecture of, of after. I think the official end date is someplace maybe the 4th of May or something, I think. So in theory, we could have like two additional weeks. Okay, But I like to keep those weeks for, for you to work on the last exercise set and also to have questions like consultation sessions, okay, before the exam. So let's try to, to do that. Uh, also, because you're in class, we are not really sure, I would try to let you know, but please try to bring your computer, okay? You probably will have, I'm doing an exercise often in class, and it's good that you're f either following or, you know, trying to help me with the calculations, okay? So if you have your laptop, uh, bring it. If not, you can team up with another friend. Okay. Um, consultation hours, sometimes some of you need. I prefer if you send me an email just to agree on a time before. Okay. But uh, let's say tentatively consultation time. Will be Fridays after class. That means from 12 to 1. Okay, but please let's uh, let's say that try to make try to make Okay, try to make an email appointment. Probably there is no issue. I'm going to be in my office. Actually, by the way, my office is um, on the 5th floor. We moved recently, office 510. Okay, 
Just you come out either if you go by elevator or you're a kind of a guy that likes to train, a girl that likes to train. So you go out of the elevator is the door to the right and then the first office just in front. Okay. I guess I'm supposed to keep an eye of who's coming early, late, and then you know use it as a leverage for my colleagues. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, let's put here office. My email address is just simply my name and my last name. Okay. So it's better if you try to reach me by email. My phone number, my mobile number, it's uh, 954, which probably I shouldn't pub publish, right? If this video is going to be, otherwise I will get a lot of calls from but you can find it on the website, okay? Otherwise, I get a lot of emails, fr uh, calls from the Microsoft uh, Center, right? That my PC has a problem. Uh, yeah, so we have a student assistant this semester. It's called Salma. Alkindira, she's uh, from Indonesia. She was uh, taking this course last year and she's currently is, uh, taking the master thesis with me. And she's going to help you with, typically with the exercise sets. Okay, if you have any questions, if you need some help, um, she's going to help with the, with the exercise set. And uh, probably she's going to try to arrange additional exercise sessions with you. Okay. That might be a bit difficult to arrange for all of you because you have different schedules, you are taking different courses, but I think she sends like a poll to all of you and then she tries to find out this time slot that suits best. For the rest that cannot make it, she usually gives them like private uh, sessions if necessary, okay, like a private appointment. But this is, this is in addition, so uh, with throughout the years we have seen that you need like some additional time for questions about and working with the exercise, okay. So just be aware that she might, she might, uh, and usually these sessions they start when we give the first exercise set. What else? Um, yeah, so we are going to communicate mainly through Blackboard, which I hope all of you have access to. It's our like education management system we're using at NTNU. We changed from another system to this one some time ago. Uh, that's the name of the course. It's in Norwegian, so field, uh, field uh, construction and operation. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to have here, I think you got an email, right? Every time I make an announcement, you get an email. So also the announcements, all the collection are going to be here. And uh, you have to the left the information, which, um, yeah, that's the link to the website of the course. That's the information of Salma, the contact email. Uh, we need usually to ensure uh, for example, one year I was giving the regular uh, projects or the regular exercise sets, but there were two other courses that also had exercise sets, okay? And by coincidence, all of us were coinciding on the same delivery date, okay? So the students, of course, they were feeling very stressed. So they never told me until the third exercise set or something. That's a problem, okay? And we don't want to give you the thing is that you have, it, the intention is for you to learn, okay? It's not to drive you to the extreme, okay? So these things could be communicated by the reference group, okay? The reference group is uh, usually three or two guys from you, okay? That they collect information, some issues that you are worried about or have to be improved, 
maybe in the teaching, maybe you're concerned about some particular thing and you communicate with me, okay? So do we have any volunteers today that want to be part of the reference group? You have, you have to collect that, you know, if you have any concerns, you have to communicate to me. You have to maybe collect some of the feedback from your uh, fellow mates. And you have to meet with me, I think, maybe three times or two times during the semester. Okay. Typically, we have between two and three, depending on how many issues we have. You? Okay. Your name? Okay, how do you spell it? O-M-R-A-M. Okay, last name? R-A-M. And your email? Uh, home run M. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we have the first volunteer. Thank you for that, Omran. Um, and, uh, you know, but we hope to have a few more, at least one or two more. But if not, I will pick someone from the list, uh, like randomly. What else we have here, the course work, we typically have for the evaluation, we are going to go back to that you know, in a bit, but uh, we have, yeah, let me maybe just write it here. Okay, the evaluation is 60% is a written exam. Well, actually now we have it digital, okay, it's called digital exam. Okay, and that's supposed to happen, I think it's 27, the date of the exam. Okay, at nine. Yeah. And 40%, uh, these are exercises. Okay, and we typically have around, is between four and five exercise sets. I will try to make the approach this semester to try to have few, fewer, but bigger exercise sets, okay? To try to compound a few in the, so it will be less work for you and also will be less work for me when correcting, okay? But let's see how that works. So typically between four and five, okay? Uh, and this is to be, to be worked in groups of three and four. You can, of course, be yourself alone in the group. It's going to be more work, uh, but we want at least maximum four, okay? Max let's put here maximum. Okay. Because then if you have too many, you stop, you know, we want that everyone will do a meaningful task, okay? And it's important to know what each other is doing, to learn, you know, what that person learned, try to communicate, but if you have more, then you, it's not that effective, okay? You have some people that simply just surf around, okay? Don't do much. So that's why I think a good number we have used in the past is three to four. But of course, you can do it with less people if you want. That's perfectly okay. Okay, and the exercises you have to deliver all. to get access to the exam, okay? And one more condition, you have to get at least 20 out of 40 in the grade, okay? So that means that you have to pass the exercise, not simply you can deliver an empty file, but you have to pass this exercise. And yeah, in, in the grade and also one more thing is that you can deliver late 
is allowed, but there is a penalty of minus 20% for every half day late okay, of the original grade. Okay, that means that if you, the first day, well, you lose only, it was 100, you lose 20 points, then you, the, the, um, the other half a day, you lose 20 points after a day, so your base, your grade will be based on 60, and then you are losing more and more. So after two and a half days, finish, okay? We also, I have to say that we have given extension if all the group has is struggling with one particular exercise set and you think you need more time that's also possible to negotiate okay but if it's only a few that maybe you were uh, lazy or i don't know so that that's the penalty you have to pay okay so yeah going back to this uh, blackboard so all the exercises will be delivered here will be shown here and I have also included here a forum that I think is useful for some of you. It, not everybody uses it during, uh, according to my experience during the last years, but uh, you can put here questions, you can create threads for exercise set one, two, three, the ones that we have, if you have questions that usually benefits other people probably should have this, uh, sometimes have the same question that you have. So it's important to, to post it here. And also if you have general questions about, about the course, okay? Or also comments. To, sometimes it won't show anything. So to get for, and, and I, I, I mentioned that it has been published. So you simply to get it to show it, to be visible, you have to join a group, okay? So for each exercise set, that's a bit weird, but that's how it works, okay? You have to join a group first Okay, for that exercise set. And then after you, it will be visible for you here. Okay, that's the way Blackboard works. It's a bit, it's a bit strange. So let's put that here, say, be aware for delivering Blackboard. Well, not might must be created. Okay, it's uh, it's not it's not going to show anything if you go without joining a group. Must be created. Sorry, is the size okay of the handwriting and uh, not too bad. Uh, let's see what else we have here in Blackboard. We have um, yeah, all the lecture notes. That means it's PDF. I'm going to make video files and class files. They're going to be published in this website. Okay, that's my my kind of university website. So you have class files. Sometimes I'm going to provide you with Excel files or input files or simulation files that are going to be here. Maybe a PDF. Um, lecture notes that will have all the PDF we have made throughout the course. Uh, reference material, I'm going to go there in a while. Uh, videos, also the video files are going to be placed here. And the exam, when it's, you know, the, the solution will be usually posted here. Uh, now regarding the videos, I have a YouTube channel that I'm, I have with a few okay so we have a few okay so that's a, those are the lectures from last year and we had this initiative because there was some one year that there were some students attending remotely okay so they if they try to play or download from the website it took a lot of time. So they prefer to have it in a streaming platform. So then I started to uploading to YouTube and since then I have been doing 
all video files are uploaded to YouTube. Okay, that means that everybody else also in the world can 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 watch them. So I'm going to ask if that's something that you want for this semester, or you prefer to have the files and download them or watch them from kind of the NT uh, NTNU website. Okay, I could create for those of you if you are concerned about something. I could create try to create like a private playlist or something. Okay, but if it's okay, fine for you. I will upload them to YouTube just like I I have been doing um, before. So that has the lectures from last year. Every year is a bit different, slightly different from changes from year to year. So uh, sometimes the explanation might be better in some of the previous years. Okay, so if I say if you don't understand something or I was maybe too fast in class or it was a poor explanation to your opinion, so you can always go back and see if in on some other years it was explained better. Uh, yeah. Okay, then we have one folder called uh, reference material. Uh, I have a link to my compendium. That's a compendium I made for this course. It has some other topics that we are not going to cover in this course, but it has some of the topics that we are discussing here in class. Okay, so whenever uh, the, the topic that I'm discussing is, is registered or is presented in the compendium, I will let you know. Okay, I will let you know you can read up more about that in the compendium. Okay, you can um, print it or you can have it as a PDF. And that's a reference material folder that I showed you before. And we have a few things here that um, we will see in a moment you have some PDO stands for Plans for Development and Operations. Okay, and you have for some fields that are freely available. Usually this is like a confidential document, but these are freely available and we are lucky to have access to them. Then you have some reading material that has a collection of articles uh, and some supplementary articles that they are not really like necessary for the pensum of the course, but I think it's nice to read them if you have the time okay, and you have the the um, you know the initiative. Okay, for all of them, uh, they there is a password, so you have to use that password to access these files. Yeah, and I think that's. Okay, so you, we are going to use this platform for communicating. If you also have some questions, just use the forum or write me an email or ask in class. Okay, we can do it. We have many channels to communicate. Uh, all information about the course will be here, but that links usually to my website and links to YouTube. Okay. So you can use that to navigate. So don't be confused that you have many different places. You use Blackboard to navigate mainly but it will link you to some other places, okay? Because it's easier for me to upload information at there. Okay. Any questions so far? I told you this is going to be a boring class, okay? So you were you were at, you were warned. Okay. So give you Oh, if any of you wants like a um, hard copy version of the compendium, let me know and I can try to, I'm going to order some copies soon. So you let me know if, if any of you uh, want. Some people are a bit old fashioned and like to have a hard copy. Okay, so we, yeah, let's check the date. I think I think the date is on the 27th, but let's just make sure. Twenty-seventh at nine, and don't be. Have you ever had a digital exam before? 
no okay don't be anxious it's quite okay actually we have tried now the last two years and it goes fine okay i was actually surprised that it went so so smooth okay so don't be anxious it's you have to feel instead of typing or writing on the paper you have to type the description and then you have to type your result the explanation everything on the computer okay usually you think that takes you know longer time some people told me it's actually faster okay but i usually make the exam such that it's uh, slightly shorter than a written exam okay for four hours for the same time okay just to avoid any any problem and you can see we have previous exams we have a link here that you can see from i think the digital was 2018 how does it look like okay so you get the text with some equations and then you have have to fill the the result okay and then you have to give your explanation and then the result has some points usually it's less than the explanation and then you get it's like a way to balance not to correct only by results okay simply by correct also by procedure okay and that's an example i think this i didn't do it that was a student so that's how it looks like actually you type like if you were you know uh, programming so i know that that is a bit skeptical uh, but don't worry i think we you will manage fine okay the last two years have been fine so you will manage okay if we have a good planning of the exam i think that that usually works this looks like a 10 but it's actually 20 okay you have to pass the exercise to to uh, have access to the exam okay we may have some guest lectures from the industry okay usually last year and the year before we had some people coming from different companies they come for one hour and they teach a topic which is relevant for this course okay we try to put it in the same time slot has has the class regular lecturing but sometimes it's not possible so we have to put it outside okay i hope some people complain they have to invest too much time in this course but you know it's also um there is one thing it's it's the uh attendance is uh is usually not not required okay but you know we are inviting these people sometimes they come from oslo come from stavanger bergen they have to invest the whole day to come here and they want to meet you they're very excited to to discuss with you get your answers get your questions so I encourage you, I always make the point that try, if we have these guest lectures, try to attend them, to, uh, try to attend as many as possible, okay? You maybe get something useful, sometimes might not be that interesting, but you know, it's, they make an effort, they help, try to help the university, and also you get something out of it, okay? Then this will be one hour, and we don't have a schedule yet, we're trying to confirm some speakers, but you know, it, it will be one hour and spread throughout the semester. Okay, sometimes every week, sometimes every two weeks, but it, it's, um, it will depend. Okay, uh, now talking a bit more about the tools that you're going to use in this uh, course. We're going to use mainly, the, our main tool will be Excel BBA. Okay. How many of you are familiar with uh, Excel? Okay, some of you. And with BBA? Language? Not much? Okay, one. Okay, BBA stands for Visual, um, Visual Basic for Applications. And basically, it's a programming language that is built behind Excel. Okay, it's based on, on basically Visual Basic, which is the language of, you know, of, of Windows. So, 
Um, it's very powerful. One of the advantages, you don't have to install something in particular on your computer. You don't have, if you have the office package that, um, you know, that usually suffices and it's very powerful where when you go afterwards to the, to your company or work life, it will take some while if you get Python or you get Fortran or you get C++ or you get whatever tool you like. Okay. But you usually always are going to have Excel and has this powerful tool that we can use for many things. Yeah, and many of our programs also don't require too much, much, much more. We usually work uh, with HiSys. How many of you have worked with HiSys before? Okay, so that's uh, uh, by a company called Aspen Tech, and it's a process simulator. Okay, that means that you can uh, make separators, distillation col columns, you can even make pipes, you can make um, valves, you can make, you can simulate all kind of things, okay? Then we might use also, that depends a bit on the time, but we usually use the IPM, which it stands for Integrated Petroleum Management Suite. Okay, that's by a company that is based in Edinburgh called Petex. And uh, it, it allows us, we will see now a bit on the topics when we go, what are we going to cover? That we want to model the whole system. Okay, we were looking into reservoir, then uh, wells, then transportation network, and then finally separated. Okay, so this is one, s this is one software that allows us to do that. But we don't want to go straight away, straight right away to that software because then you lose a bit, you know, it hides a bit all the complexity behind. You simply become a bit of a user and they, you know, you don't want to be a dumb user of this program. You want to be smart and you want to understand what's happening behind. Okay? In case any problem happens, you're able to QC your result, you're able to understand better your result, and you're able also to challenge your result. And maybe let's try this year, are you all going to be like a guinea pigs? We're going to try to have some Python, okay? I'm not sure how successful we are going to be, but, um, and typically we're going to use that as a Jupyter notebooks. Let's do with that. Okay, how many of you are familiar with Python? Few, only one. No, uh, Jupyter notebook. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Okay, we will try because there are some. There are some exercises we make with Excel that actually take, they are a bit, uh, in Excel you have to put all the information in the memory, in the Excel sheet, okay? So if you have sometimes we're making probabilistic stochastic analysis that we have to load like 1,000, 10,000 cells, okay? And that cell becomes very heavy, it becomes a bit congested. So it is much easier to use another language which is, doesn't have to show all the time in the display the, the rows and the columns, but it has it in the memory. Okay, that saves a lot of a lot of uh, computational um, uh, you know, footprint. Okay, but then we have to pay the price that we have to get a bit used to the syntax and we have to see how what command do we use. Okay, so let's see. We will try to use it for especially reserve estimation with Monte Carlo. Okay, we have one part that we do typically in Excel. We will do the first part in Excel and then we move to Python and then it hopefully it's, it's a bit uh, faster. Okay, that's all I think I have to say on the boring side, on the rules of the game. Then we have to do some teaching. Okay, we have to give you an introduction to the course. Any, so uh, how many of you are using uh, Mac? Macintosh, one? 
So Excel has some tricks to work with uh, Mac. Okay, I think usually it works fine, but some people that had like older versions of Excel, sometimes it doesn't work very well with VBA. They have to do some tricks. Okay, so be aware if you're Mac, you don't use a vir virtual machine on your Mac. No, okay. you're a pure Mar Mac guy. Okay. Uh, hi, this these programs, HiSys, you don't have to install on your computer. We are going to use something called the Farm, which allows you to run the program remotely. It re runs on a server at NTNU and then uh, remotely shows on your computer. You just have a window that you can use the program. So that we use for HiSys, we are going to use Farm, probably it's quite a heavy program, has a lot of options, but we are not going to use all of them. We're going to use in a very simple way HiSys. So it's not not efficient to load it on your computer, okay? IPM, that we're going to be using in the computer lab. We don't have too many licenses, unfortunately, and the computer lab is just here, outside, and not, well, is the room just across the hall, okay, just in front. And there are, we have only 10 licenses, so probably you have to team up. And Python that you do from your own computer. Okay. And we will see if we have to do some installation or if we do any browser uh, Jupyter notebook. Okay, so let's now take a break, right? We have already, uh, yeah, 45 minutes, so you deserve a break. Okay, and we come back with the introductions to the questions. So if I may ask, where are you coming from? Like from which program? Are any of you here from the, inter uh, the Norwegian five-year program? No. Who are, uh, who's of you um, are from the international master program in Potomac? Okay, almost all of you. Okay. At the two years, right? Yeah. And uh, do we have anyone here from the natural gas specialization? You are kind of a change, uh, yeah, for one semester, so now you. Uh, okay, yeah. Because sometimes we have people that don't have, um, like, background in uh, petroleum. They come in from chemical engineering or they come from a downstream study, so I have to I have to adjust a bit how the, the topic, okay? But in that case, we I think we don't have that problem. But anyhow, if... if if you feel like you don't understand something, let me know and we can adjust it midway, okay? That's the importance of uh, a communicator. Yeah. Okay, so as I told you, I will give you uh, links to articles, to extracts of books. Uh, my compendium has some information, but if you want to have like one source, uh, probably is too going to be too generic, but this will give you an overview. This book gives you like an overview of the whole uh, development and production of oil and gas here. It's a bit generic, okay? You won't be able to do engineering too much with it, calculation to, it will be difficult, but at least gives you, is something that contains like almost all topics that we are going to discuss, okay? It's a very nice book. You don't have to buy it. We are going to, I'm going to give you some some pages of this book, but um, but if you want to dig more uh, into it, you know that's a good book to to have and to check. I think we have some in the library, not many, but I think we have some. Okay, so let's talk about the course. I think here we have on the course we have two main things that we are going to look at. Okay, we have field development and we have also operations so in development we have typically we have a clear objective our objective is to maximize project value okay we have to maximize economic value usually some sort of economics okay we are not doing that for charity or we are not that's actually 
we want to give energy to society, but also we have to make sure that it's profitable. Otherwise, we're going to go bankrupt. Okay, so that's the main goal that we have in field development is to maximize economic value of uh, hydrocarbon exploitation project. Okay. But that's not the whole story. Okay, we have also to fulfill and that's very important, okay, that's, that, that we can do that many ways, okay, but we have to uh, subject it to, and the, the things more important that we are, at least we're going to discuss here, you might take other courses and you see that the politics are a bit constrained, the geographical constraints, the environmental constraints, here we're going to talk technical constraints related to petroleum engineering, okay? So say technical constraints, okay? And here we say in general engineering or we are going to discuss focus mostly in this course in petroleum engineering. And also to HSE, okay? I thought I was struggling between the, the initials in Norwegian and in English. So it's uh, health, safety, and environment, okay? You have to have, you have to, your operations, you have to make in with some, some HSE constraints. Okay? In a safe, environmentally friendly, and uh, respecting the health of your workers in a, in a manner that it's, so these are the two main and the biggest constraints we have for the, when developing the field, okay? And there are two different mindsets, completely different, development and operations, okay? Okay, and this value actually you have is, is not only for everyone, okay? Not everyone is usually involved in that project, but it's for you want to maximize that for the people that are the owners of that project, okay, which are the shareholders. It's a bit of a cold way to look at it, but actually that's how it works. You have some people that they are participating in that project, even by injecting capital, you have some operators, you have an oil uh, company, they, they are the shareholders and you want to maximize that project to find a way to maximize the economic value for the shareholders, but while fulfilling with these, these constraints, which it sounds like a small thing, but actually is what's shaping most of the, most of the project. Okay? And typically we have, so what are the steps for doing that? I'm going to make it very simplified here. We want to first to define, we have a series of steps, okay? We have to, first the main thing is to design or decide on the main features of the field. features can mean many things, but basically it's how I'm going to produce it, for how long I'm going to produce it, what rates I'm going to produce, what kind of pressure recovery strategy I'm going to use, uh, to which market I'm going to sell, I'm going to send these products, um, what kind of platform I'm going to use. Yeah, something also a small, uh, uh, well, a big detail, okay? Our course is going to be focused on offshore oil and gas production. We are going to have some examples of onshore, but most of our examples are going to be focused, are going to be um, using as a, as a case the offshore oil and gas production. Okay. Some of the things are applicable, some of the things are not, and we are going to have a short discussion. You're going to get also um, a paper, some extract of a book to read, and about what are the main differences, okay, between offshore and onshore. 
some projects onshore they are just like projects offshore they are in the same way because of the connection the isolation the size and everything but sometimes they can be very very different you have some advantages in onshore projects that you don't have in offshore okay offshore usually you don't have anything so not only you can go and pinch one place and then start to produce see if it's good and then try to expand from it okay you have to have a plan from the beginning when you go inside an offshore project okay so that that's uh, part of the main difference so most of our examples are going to be offshore and gas oil and gas production and typically from fields in Norway okay, we're going to use a lot of examples from fields in Norway but some of the same principles can be applied for fields in offshore Africa from offshore in the South, South China Sea Australia uh, can be applied in the Gulf of Mexico so the same thing can be applied to some other places so don't feel discouraged that you say well I'm never going to come back to Norway I'm going to go and live in the South China Sea or I'm going to live some other place if you work on offshore probably it's going to be uh, relevant for you okay so we want to design on the main features of the field okay and typically we have like a workflow for doing that okay so then we have to define typically we have to define what we call a KPI some sort of a KPI that's going to tell me something over which I make decisions okay I have some indicator and then the indicator has to go up. If it goes up, then it means that I, I have some conditions, some features that are more attractive than others. Okay. Define KPS for the for the project. Okay. The KPI stands for key performance indicator. We're going to see now what is it, but usually it's it's an economy, okay? it's an economic indicator. It's very, s sometimes you try to create all kinds of indicators, but usually you take decisions mainly based on economy, okay? What gives you highest profit, okay? That fulfills all, all the constraints. So you have to define KPIs that you're going to use. You have to collect information And then you have to define or you have to try to find out alternatives. What kind of alternatives do I have? Okay. Then you have to analyze data or analyze evidence. Okay. With you get maybe some more information, you try to process that information, you try to create models that give you, that process that information, and finally, you have to choose an alternative. Okay. So that's, and that process is actually repeated. Usually I don't define KPI, sometimes I do, but actually that process is repeated many, many times during the field uh, decision development process, okay? Collecting information, which is expensive, defining alternatives, initially I might have some alternatives, but I might have some other options, talking new technology, talking to other people, um, sharing information with other companies. Here, it will be modeling, something that here at NTNU, and I guess in your also universities where you took your previous studies we make a lot of emphasis on that okay we have simulators we have where we take all of this data and we try to make get some more information something that is valuable okay some other type of data we take the subsurface information, fluid information, and we try to convert that into production profiles, for example. Okay, because we cannot say much with how much. Okay, we have so many, so big pocket of rock. 
where we have okay where we have oil and gas okay we have to get how much can we get from these blocks okay what is going to be the production profile in time and that will allow me to calculate what's going to be my revenue from these two So we're going to be working on that quite a lot, okay, on that part, on the development part. And on operations, I'm just going to give some, along the lectures, I'm going to give some comments on operations. But operations actually is completely different mindset. I also have to define KPIs, okay, and it's also some sort of economic indicator, but can be also uptime, can be also revenue, can be cost, can be spills, can be any anything. But here I have another completely different mindset, okay? What do I try to do here? I'm trapped with an existing system. Here I have, on the development part, I have the sky, in a way, the sky is the limit. Everything is very flexible. Okay, I have a lot of options if you try to make, and that's something that many people show, if you try to make a plot with time, Initially, you have almost no information, and then you have a lot of information. Okay. But you have the flexibility you have in the system initially is almost infinite. Okay. Initially, you have a lot of flexibility. But as the time progresses and I have almost no information. So how can you take a good decision not knowing what you have? If it's maybe gas, maybe oil, how big it is, how, how, what's the permeability of the rock, how much I will be able to produce, what is the ultimate recovery? I don't know at this point, but I can choose from many different options. I can choose to have three, 20 wells, 40 wells. I can choose to have two platforms, one platform. I can have many, many options. But then as time passes, I have to take decisions based on very little information. And that's something that is very, very special for field when developing a field during this phase. Okay. I have to take a lot of decisions. I have to reduce that flexibility, okay, depending on little amount of information. Okay. Remember, most of the information I get, when do I get it? You have been working like, you know, with reso those of you who, 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 are, who here are uh, reservoir guys, reservoir engineers, yeah? So what uh, do you work in the operation phase, mostly? You dream about having a history match model, right? Your reservoir model that you're making, you try, you dream that it will exactly reproduce your production, right? And that's where you get most information. If you try to match these two, you say, well, now I have my model is actually exactly representing what I have in the field, okay? But that I have only very late, but I don't have any more flexibility, okay? So that's, that's like a paradox that we have. So we are in the operations, we are stuck with an existing system. Okay, we have to Two things, we have to reduce the impact of the, um, of, we are always going to make poor decisions, okay, sometimes. Some things that are no ide not ideal. But we have to reduce the impact of those, the disadvantages of the system. And we have to maximize or exploit okay. exploit the advantages that I have on my system. That those things that I actually design in a proper way, those things I have to try to exploit. Okay, let's call it maybe not disadvantages, but maybe deficiencies is a better word. System deficiencies. Okay. 
Okay, so we try to optimize or even not optimize, you cannot maybe assure that that's the optimum, the best you can get, but I want to effectivize, if that might not be even a word, but we try to make it more effective, effectivize production. So just be aware of these two mindsets and the difference we have. We have a lot of information here, but our system is frozen. Okay. We have other, maybe other priorities. We have other KPIs, but our system is frozen. So we have to, st are stuck. Any change we want to make is going to be too costly. Okay, or it's usually going to be very costly. While here I have, the sky is the limit. But then when I take decisions, I have very little information and I have a variety of scenarios that they can play out. I can have a big reservoir, I can have a small reservoir. I can have, you know, very tight formation, very, uh, very nice formation. Okay. So let's go to uh, the life cycle. And that's probably something that you can already have an intuition how it looks like the life cycle of a hydrocarbon fuel. Okay, what do we start with usually? We have pre-exploration, something that we call pre-exploration. Okay, then we have exploration phase. And sometime, if we are lucky enough, or if, you know, we have a smart uh, geophysicist, uh, then we have here, we have a discovery. Some place here. Okay, we have some pre-exploration phase, exploration phase, and we have a discovery, then we have if everything goes fine, then what is the next step usually? Appraisal. Okay, that I want to see that discovery that I made, what are the characteristics of that discovery? How big it is? What properties does it have? How is the fluid? After that, what do I have? If everything Somebody said something? It's okay to developing. developing, but we have one part before, which is the planning, okay? Field planning. What we call development might be everything, but let's call first field planning. If we have, at some point, we have some indication in the appraisal, right, that, that is worth continuing with that, we go now to the field planning. And that's where our course is going to be focused on, okay, in this phase. Okay, then after we have field planning, we have field construction. Okay, what do we have after? After well, we have no choice but to have operations. And after operations, we have decommissioning and abandonment. Sorry, is the handwriting okay? Okay, yeah. Don't have the best handwriting, but uh, I hope you can understand. Okay? So, we are going to go in detail into that process. And also, I want to say that there are some tasks. You have been taking some courses, or you will take some courses also, 
So they look into very much into the pre-expiration and expiration. Okay, we have an empty new seismic interpretation. We have uh, basin modeling. We have uh, geology. We have many things that are working courses that are working on that area. Okay, so my intention, I'm not going to repeat. I'm not going to go deep into those. Okay, I will say that that will be covered by other courses. Also, you have during the late stages of field planning, you have, and also you have petrophysics, uh, log interpretation. Um, then in the late part, you have reservoir modeling. Okay, so I assume all of those we are going to put less weight, or actually we are not going to discuss them that much in this course. Okay, even though they are important. Okay, you see here that's actually the starting point to get the field planning. So don't underestimate the importance. The thing is that this was is discussed in detail in some other courses we have at the NTNU. Okay, so I'm going to focus now on when usually when we have a discovery and we have making appraisal and how to plan the field from an early phase to a most more or less mature phase. Okay. Any of you uh, taking geosciences? from the international master. No? So the rest, you, we have one reservoir lady, and wha what are the rest studying? Production? Reservoir? Produ one production? Reservoir? Oh, so you are in reservoir, all of you. Drilling. Okay. Drilling, okay. One drilling, one production, the rest is reservoir. Okay, so that, that's like the previous years, that's fine. I was hoping to get more people in production, but no. Okay. The other thing I want to tell you here is that the time scale operations, okay, depending on how, but it can be something between 5, 30, maybe we have fields now in the North Sea approaching 40 years. Okay. So don't let the size of the square tell you something about the length. Okay. That's going to be something that maybe takes a long time. Field construction might be something between, I don't know, maybe between three, maybe six years. Okay, and all the rest, maybe planning two, maybe three, five years, appraisal also. Maybe you have some area that it takes a long time to explore. But the thing is that the time scale can be very dependent. And usually operations is the one that has the longest time scale. So all of the rest is very short compared to operations. So that also shows you the complexity. Operations, I get a lot of data, but I'm fixed and stuck with the system. Okay. While here, this happens relatively quickly compared to operations, but I have to take a lot of decisions in that during that period. Okay. So let's look a bit more in detail. The way I do, okay, um, so field planning, let's put here, maybe start to put some, um, so how it is executed in real life, okay? So before, just after appraisal, after field planning, you have a point called, the way the, the process is structured, we use DG decision gate did you take did you have any kind of economy project management course where they talk about decision gate no okay dg stands for decision gate okay and it's a process that actually i divide in stages my process okay and in each at the end of each stage i have to have this decision gate where i can decide to continue I can decide to abandon, or I can decide to wait, or maybe redo one stage, okay? And that usually have to design, I have a team, a whole, the field development team might be very, like, heterogeneous. I have different people from different disciplines, but at the end, that team has to give, like, a, a summary, and that summary is evaluated in some sort of a board in a company, okay? 
that they decide if to go forward or not. I think that some people call it the Ericsson Ericsson process, okay? Process for project management. Okay. But basically we have decision gates in every stage where we decide continue forward, just stop and abandon, maybe wait and redo the same. I have usually these four these four choices. Okay? And this one we have here is decision gate zero. Ericsson or Ericsson, um, I don't remember now, but I think it's in Wikipedia. If you go to decision gate, it tells you some history about this, this, this process. Okay. Okay, and then on the planning, we have, usually it's not only one box because it's so complex that we have uh, several boxes. And we have, the first part is Feasibility studies. Okay. Then we go to concept planning. Then we go to pre-engineering. And in all of them, we have some DG gates, okay, decision gates. One, we have DG2, and we have DG3. That's typically offshore, Norway, some other places. That's how these projects are, are um, arranged. Let's see if I hope I got it correct. Okay, we have some Norwegian terms. Also, you're going to be working, some of you, in Norway. So you need to get um, uh, the Norwegian nomenclature. So this one is called uh, BOK, which stands for Beslutning om Konkretisering. Feasibility studies, the main thing is, so first DG1, let's say D, what happens. We will see more in detail what happens in each decision gate, okay? But basically, DG0 is simply to say, is there a business case here? Can, do we have a field? Is it possible to produce it? Maybe we found something, but it's somewhere in the Arctic Pole, and we, uh, some one geologist will tell me that's like, no, will never happen, that's crazy, okay? But let's assume, okay, uh, hypothetical. Uh, and then we have to decide if we have a business case. Maybe we found a very nice field, but it's in some war zone that I cannot exploit. Okay, so I, that's to define either if I have a business case or not. That's why all of these phase, usually all these three steps, usually are called business identification phase. Okay, business case identification. Okay, then we have DG one, Beslutning om Konkretisering. Um, not um. that is basically try to define if there are any feasible concepts how to produce this reservoir, how to produce this resource. And if they are, how many they are, how many options do we have? Okay, we're going to go in detail on that, but just to let you know where we are. Then we take a decision, yes, there is, okay, and we want to continue with those, okay, where there is something that, that brings value to that project. And then we have BOV, which stands for Beslutning Om Bidereferring, which the translation will be on execution or continuation. And in that, DG2 is very critical. 
here I have a lot of options. Here I have concept planning. I have to evaluate all of these options, compare these options, see which one is the most likely, the one that gives most value. And this sometimes might take one year only, okay, or two years. So then you have to take a decision on which option is the one I'm going to choose. And from there, everything will be locked from DG2. Okay, we're going to have the break soon, so don't worry. I see that you're already tired. Okay, then comes after you have selected one option, then we go to the pre engineering phase that we have to define, go in detail to try to define all the details of that choice, of that concept that I have. That means what kind of platform I'm going to need. So what are the technical requirements for that platform? Okay. If I want to buy a platform, I don't go to the shelf and buy a platform, but I have to say I need a platform to handle this amount of oil, gas and water. I need it to have the following facilities. I need it to, to deal with this amount of crude. I want it to have dehydration. I want it to have so many pumps, so many compressors. You have to make like uh, a requirement list a list of requ technical requirements that you need. And that's a pre-engineering, and after that I go to DG3, where I have Beschlutning on Jenumfeld, on execution. Where I finally sanction and I say, yes, I'm going to execution. Yes, I'm going to go forward with my project or, or no, I'm going to wait. Something major, if only something major happens, usually I take the decision in DG0 to go forward. But if I already pass DG2, DG1 and DG2, that means I have already have done my homework. I have already one concept that might work to develop the field, okay? Uh, then we have, okay, so in the field construction, that was for the planning, and those are the phases that I have on the planning and on the, on the uh, construction. Sorry for, for the mess, but you will see it together in one page uh, just now. Then we have, instead of the pre-engineering, we have the detailed engineering go for it, I have all my plans, everything is fixed, the type of platform I want, how I want to produce the field, um, and then I go to the construction, and then I go finally to the phase of testing and startup. And finally, before we go to operations, we have one last decision gate. DG4. I don't know how that's called in Norwegian, but um, basically I decide if to operate the field or not. As you can imagine, very has to be something very dramatic that happened here during this phase to decide not to produce the field. Okay, maybe a huge cost overrun, maybe there was a, an accident, maybe there was a natural disaster that caused something, but really has to be something very, very major to decide not to go forward with the project. Okay. We have had some cases in the Norwegian continental shelf that have large overrun, that they have large expenses, that the project really is in negative, maybe won't be profitable, but they still, everything is in place, so they still have to go and start to make money. Okay, so remember, that's the main panorama. Pre-exploration, exploration, appraisal, field planning, construction, operations, decommissioning, and abandonment. And within field planning, I have these three boxes, which are very important. The first one, before, DG0. Do I have a business case or not at all? The next one, feasibility studies. I try to map all concepts that I might have. Which ones might be relevant for this field? I don't care, it can be using a electric, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe producing with a balloon, producing with a FPSO, uh, putting a pipeline all the way to the US, crazy ideas, everything goes there. 
I try to see which one is the best. Then DG2, I try to refine, compare these concepts, see which one is the most likely, the, the one that will have most profit, the one that will be most attractive, and from there unlock. DG2, I select one, and then I refine and go through only that one. DG3, we will see something very spo special happens here. You have to issue, at this stage, you have to issue the PDO. Okay, which stands for Plan for Development and Operations. And that's something I say, that's a plan I have to produce my field. And you gave it to the authorities, they have to approve it, at least here in Norway, and they have to give you feedback on this report, and then they tell you, yes, you can go forward. And then I take, I, I take the decision to go forward. Construction is split into three phases, detail engineering, I have to refine. If here I made it on this, what kind of platforms, what kind of facilities, here I go to the level of even screws, okay? I need so many screws for this vessel. This vessel will have this thickness. Okay, it will have this interior uh, protection. Okay, construction, testing, and startup, and finally have DG4 just before operation. That clear? Okay, so now let's take a break. I think it's you are tired. So and we come back uh, 11, let's say 10 or 11 uh, for the last part. Okay, of the course. Of this, of this lecture. I think it's a bit more efficient if I write and then we will have to run and, uh, and I can explain something while you are writing. So these are the topics tentative, okay? We usually, every year is a bit different. So today we are covering the overview of the field development process. General considerations will be next class, maybe next Friday also, but usually it's like one class, and I give you some reading material here. Um, you cannot, it's nice to know about the process, okay? You are familiar with what's happening, you're familiar about the uh, work processes, but you have to be able, you're engineers, okay? We are all engineers, so we have to be able to do things, to do calculations. So I think that's, I'm making emphasis on some engineering tasks that you have to make in this process, that's where we are going to be looking more in detail, okay? So then we go to, actually this should have been, like the, the real order should be value chain model, NPV quantification, like I mentioned before, most of our decisions are based on some economic indicator, economic KPI. In this case it's NPV, which stands for net present value. However, to calculate that net present value, you need to know how the field is going to perform, what I call the field production performance. Okay. Uh, so that's why I put this part before the NPV. Okay. To get NPV, you need rates. Basically, you need rates versus time. And to get these rates, you have to know, understand how the field performs. Okay. So that's why we flip it and we have that part before. So all of these, we are going to take different variations of that field, okay? Taking different things. But we need some tools to model that field. Okay. So we are going to be looking at some things that you have seen before, then in a very brief way, some tools that we use to model the fields, material balance, IPR, TPR, the, the effect of choke, okay? Like reservoir engineers, production, we like very much chokes. Reservoir engineers don't care. But actually, it's the main component that you have to control production. Okay, so when we are scheduling, means computing and deciding on rates of the field with time. If it's oil rates or gas rates. So when you decide or when you try to fix these rates, you use some control elements. Okay, sometimes can be choke, sometimes can be a pump, okay, sometimes can be artificial lift. Okay. Then most of our fields, they are not simply one well, or they are not simply standalone wells that I manage separately. But I have networks. Networks are very common if you have a subsea system. 
you join all of the wells together, they produce to one pipe, and then that pipe is what goes to the platform or to the or to the ship. Okay? So we have to know a bit how do networks behave? What is so special about networks? Okay, that's usually something that you don't think too much. Using that that occasion, we're going to talk a bit about downhole networks, not so relevant for field development, but most and most wells, they have the option to control not only on a well basis, but also to control on a section basis. Okay, you make it more like a Robocop. Okay, has like a lot of things that I can change inside and I can control production. So it becomes even more important to think not only I control on a well level, but I also control on a segment or on a section level within the well. Coupling, that's what we use in reality. We don't use too much material balance, but we use coupling with reservoir simulator. And like I said, there is a whole course in NTNU. If you are passionate about reservoir simulator, you're probably going to take it, but you think we need to have this coupling in place. Okay, this is important. Relationship between plateau height and plateau length very important if I'm planning to produce for some period of time and suddenly I produce less or I produce more, you know, how to calculate that. Production potential is a very important concept. People in reservoir engineer use it, but we can use it applied for the whole field, wells, networks, uh, separator, and we can use it also to plan scheduling this production potential. We're going to talk a bit more on that later. Then we close that topic, we go to NPV. Again, we are not going to talk about all tax regimes, all production sharing regimes, all the revenue in income quantification. For that, there is another course okay, called Petroleum Economics that some of you probably are taking. So we are going to tell you just one example with some assumptions to see how you calculate from the technical data, how you calculate NPV. Might be a bit simplified, but then you go to this petroleum economics course and they tell you like all the all the different uh, royalties, uh, taxes, etc. Then we are talking about offshore and we are talking about subsea fields. So flow assurance is a big part of it. It's a big technical constraint. Can increase cost, can change completely how the field looks like introduces some very strong requirements. So we have to look a bit into flow assurance, okay? And again, not only that you know, like people like to know what is wax, what is hydrate, what is emulsion, I, l I know it, very nice, but also how to compute it, okay? So we have, we're going to talk about the layout of subsea production system, how it is in particularly Norway. And modeling, usually we have flipped in the past between wax or hydrate. Okay, so let's see, this year we will decide what to choose from. Just so you get one example, you do the calculations and you see what are the repercussions of that in the field development. Okay, the length of the line, the insulation of the line, and the management, the production, the chemicals that I have to inject. Okay. Uh, offshore structures, type and selection. The offshore structures is actually a big part of the cost. Okay, this guy is very heavy on cost. So it's impacting a lot in the NPV, in the how much I have to expend. And it's also not so trivial. So I don't want you to be expert on ocean structures, on uh, marine environment, but you have to know enough such that you can understand the language, okay, of what, of what, uh, how they are chosen and what kinds do I have available, what is important to take into account when selecting a structure. Okay, and lastly, which I think is not a small topic, but it's actually huge, okay, is remember, we have this chart. Always keep in mind this chart, okay. You have no information and you have to take a lot of decisions, okay. So we have to find proper methods to quantify uncertainty, okay, either by, we're going to see a two things this semester, is stochastic analysis, we're going to change randomly or we're going to change with some uh, strategy the input, change the input and check how much, how that impacts the output, okay, my NPV. For example, the size, I change the size and see, well, how will that affect my NPV? Okay. And also, that's a way 
probability trees, maybe I, if I do that, I have to make too many samples, okay? For example, millions of samples or thousands of samples. It will be maybe unpractical in the time scale of a field of a, of a development of a field if I have to run the same model 10,000 times. So for that, I have an option which is probability trees that I can try to capture still uncertainty in like in a slightly easier way and I can also include decision making. Okay. And it's something that I use very much in appraisal. So to practice those, we're going to have usually two or three exercises, but one on reserve estimation, one on decision on appraisal or offshore structure, and usually we have one on NTV, on business case identification. So that's the game plan. That's what is usually, and it might change depending on how much we cover, but that's like all the topics that are covered uh, here, okay, in this course. Okay, so if you are not too tired, or you are tired. Yeah, w I think we have to, either you show up on Monday early, can we do this presentation? Okay, or we take now half an hour and we at least cover part of it. Or do you feel like tired already? It's going to be a lot of me talking, okay? It's uh, slides, it's not very optimal to, to learn. Okay. So do you have, I'm wondering if you are, do you feel like you have learning still left on the brain to absorb information or you prefer to leave it for Monday? Monday? How many say on Monday? Two, three, okay, the rest? So we have only half and half, almost. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, let's see how many slides we have. Okay, let's go for a few, uh, maybe five minutes now, and then we, the rest we take it on Monday, okay? But you have to, at first I have to wake up on Monday, and you also have to wake up on Monday, okay? Okay, so I have tried throughout the years to teach this part, okay? And I have tried all kind of things. Me writing, you writing, you explaining, me explaining, PowerPoint, no PowerPoint. And so far, this is the best approach. So I apologize if it's not optimal for, for all, all of you, but uh, that's what we will have. It's a lot of, of, of uh, steps, okay? So those are the phases that I mentioned before. And you have this now this decision gate, okay? So you have to remember more or less this uh, workflow, but also you can shrink it, okay? You can compress it to identification of business case here at DG0, you, you issue a statement of commerciality, SOC. Okay. And then you have all of these three blocks that I explained before, they are grouped into scoring time. Okay, so you can have identification of business case, then you go to project planning, then you go to project execution that involve these three blocks, and then you have operation and decommission. Okay, just try to remember all of this. Usually all fields are developed in this way, okay? Some onshore fields not, but only if they have existing infrastructure, if you can produce them uh, slowly, slowly. So the value chain model, okay? During this project planning, and actually a bit before when I'm identifying the case, I have to make a value, it's called a value chain, a model of the value chain, okay? With my value chain involving all the elements that are required to have a field. In a very early phase, it might be only subsurface, okay, how much the, my sites need, the volumes I have, where are my contracts, what are the properties of the rock I have. Maybe it might be how I'm going to produce that, okay, which I would say here architecture, but how is it going to be you know, floated, simply sending that production to shore. It might be producing to an existing field, and also when, okay, so that field might be produced. 10 years from now, in five years, in uh, 20 years, depending on the market, okay? And after I have, and I usually have many options for that. On that value, I compute 
when I show you for our key indicator, key performance indicator. And on top of that, I have also maybe some studies. I, I have a team that is just doing some studies. And from there I have to move to each decision gauge, just maybe discarding some of what I have. The uncertainty, right? For example, the uncertainty in permeability, and I have a distribution or on the contact, on the volume, they still continue from one case to the other. What I'm trying to do is try to eliminate some options that I decide upon. Okay. For example, the size of floater, for example, the number of wells, uh, etc. Okay. And that I try to make at a very early stage, even when I'm doing the identification. Okay. And you see here the other thing you have to see in each different discipline. Initially, you don't need, maybe you need a reservoir guy, you need a facilities guy, maybe you need the geologist, you need maybe geophysicist. So it has, this becomes the value chain model we will see here. After, it might look something like that, okay? Where you have the well, the drilling guys, you have the reservoir guys, you have the subsea system guys, you have the production guys, you have the processing guys, you have the economist, okay, you have uh, the project manager, you have many different disciplines involved, and it's becoming more and more complex. As I started to get more and more information, okay, I start, and how do I get information? Basically drilling wells, right, or doing seismic. But at this stage, if I already did my exploration, I did my discovery, Basically, the only way to get more information is to keep, to keep reading, okay? Okay, and this side. If I want to get more and more information, I have either to manipulate the information I have, or I have to drill more wells, okay? Which is expensive, and depending on the size of the reservoir, I might not be so willing to, to do it. Okay, so let's, cut it here, uh, the lecture, and uh, we just keep, I will remember, try to remember, and also you try to remember, uh, we are just going to cover the identification of this mistake in the next class, okay? Before we close, any questions? No? Okay, see you on Monday. Enjoy the weekend.